Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Panther Puri. As you can tell, I am not the dulcet tones of Jacob Langsam. He is not with us today, but joining us is TJ Peterson and from Channel 10 WPLG, Ian Margo. Did I get WPLG right or did I get that wrong? Oh, awesome. So we're just going to leave all that in because I'm a professional broadcaster or I'm a professional (laughs) podcaster. But yeah, we got Ian Margol from WPLG, more importantly, part of the Goal Union with us today. And yeah, after a back-to-back sweep of the Devils and Buffalo Sabres, the Panthers are in the playoffs. There's 13 games left in the regular season and the Panthers are in the playoffs. Playoff tickets are on sale for the, in the earliest they've ever been. So how are we all feeling right now? I was looking at flights to Washington. That's how good I'm feeling. This is the same person who was convinced the Panthers were going to lose all day on Saturday is now looking to book flights to Washington means he expects the Panthers to not only win the division, but win the Eastern conference in terms of regular season points. I cannot tell you how different it is when the game is not on versus when the game is on in terms of my anxiety. It's like, once I see the the puck drop, I'm like, Oh shit. Like they're going to lose. They're going to lose. They're going to lose. Maybe it's just like a sort of learned helplessness because it's still the Florida Panthers. That's my hypothesis. I think it absolutely is. There's no question about it. Uh, And then they kind of gave you reason for that anxiety in New Jersey a couple of days ago. So (laughs) that was, uh, I, I think you guys know I was at that game. That was a wild a wild game to be at, but you mentioned that their playoff tickets on sale. By the time people hear this, they're likely going to be sold out because I'm pretty sure they're pretty close to sold out right now. Aren't they? Yeah. Uh, I know the lower bowl sold out for games one and two, and there's just like. Not before I could get some, by the way, I got some tickets for game one in the lower bowl. But I mean, I I would assume they're still holding some back for, you know, season ticket holders who want to add on for the full season for the full playoffs. Cause obviously when they can guarantee themselves, you know, 16, you know, 10 to 16 games worth of playoff revenue versus, you know, individual tickets, you know, they're going to do that, even though the, you know, the the whole sticker for the entire season is a lot cheaper than the individual tickets, but, you know, they want that guaranteed revenue. I mean, just could, you know, kind of riff off what TJ was saying, like, you know, the Panthers are, you know, we're, we're all still like scarred by this hockey team. If you go through my uh, Facebook right now, all I'm getting are memories from like the last two decades of, me complaining endlessly about how the Panthers are either choking away a playoff spot or just completely out of it. And it's just nothing but depressed Alex, like, ah, shit, the Panthers let me down again. Like every single day, whether it's 2012 or 2010 or 2016, 2015. And now I'm just like, huh, things are good. I don't have any of these feels anymore because this team is a wagon. And for them to be comfortably there. I mean, this early and with this many wins at first in the league. And if I read another Avs fan or just oblivious NHL fan, be like, how is that possible? The Avs have more points and not understand that it has nothing to do with that because they are in totally different conferences. Nonetheless, the fact that they are the first team in the NHL, did it this early with this many wins in this way, you know, I understand, TJ, what you mean by you get anxiety when the puck drops, but it's got it does feel good when when the puck is hasn't dropped yet. <laughs> yeah, and I mean they're still number one in my heart because they're number one in score adjusted Corsi at five on five. So in the Corsi mm-hmm. Hockey League, they're looking good. But I mean, I say that in jest. I'm like 50% joking, but the other 50% of me really like considers this a valuable predictor for not only regular season success, but playoff success. And we saw, you know, dating back, everybody talks about the 2011, 12 Kings. Oh, they were an eight seed. They were an underdog with a Cinderella run, but the people who knew like Thomas Drance was one of the first people who was like, you know, look at the possession stats that the Kings had. And they were top five, top three in the league. And a lot of them. And that, that was a team that once they got the goaltending that they got from Jonathan quick, it was done. And we've seen, you know, Bob's been on, Bob's been off, Spencer's been on, Spencer's been off. But knowing that like you only really need your goalie to be decent in order to have a very good chance of winning pretty much every game you play, that's a good feeling. It's a very good feeling. No, and it's, I think I heard you guys say this previously. It may have been in a a podcast I did with you guys, uh, but it's nice to, the Panthers 
the Panthers, uh, their goal this season or this playoff seems to be, the strategy seems to be, we dare you to score more goals than us. Uh, and the Devils tried and failed. It will be a little more difficult against some of the teams that we'll face in the playoffs, but that's an adorable picture right now uh, with the little one with the Florida Panthers hat. But uh, yes, yeah, Tommy has joined the podcast. Tommy today, Lopez. Tommy, there's a full hey, distraction of, I have absolutely no idea what I was saying. That was too cute. It's going to be anyway, awesome be- when we can bathe Tommy in the cup. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they're going to let me borrow the cup for a bath, though this kid would love no, to take no, a crap just, in it. Just, just go to with us to um, Story after they, after they win it, and we'll, we'll put him in there. Or when they do, like, you know, when they put it out in front of the the uh, Florida Live Arena for, you know, the photo ops, we'll just take it, and then all of a sudden my kid's naked and in the cup, and, and I'll just pour a bottle of water into the top, and then security's <laughs> going to be running in. I'm like, sorry, guys, just, you know, you guys waited a long time, so did I. Mm. You I think Tommy's on board. Tommy's on board. So I think he'd rather drink a milk out of the cup. <laughs> and it is past his bedtime, so, you know, he is... Uh, He's a little fussy right now. We've so, all yeah, been there. We've all, we've all been there. I mean, he just sounds like TJ during that, that comeback in the, on Saturday. Um, I, I cannot deny that. It, it's factual. I would love to, but I cannot. But, yeah, I, I mean, what you were talking about, Ian, before Tommy rudely interrupted us was like, yeah, I dare you to try and outscore us. And, you know, as that comeback was happening, you had, like, that lightning fan, lightning fan in our mentions or the, uh, the lightning reporter was like, oh, well, can they win games 2-1? And it's like, I don't know if the Panthers can win games 2-1, but you know how I do know they win? They can win games 6-2. They can win games 7-6. They can win games 5-3. They can win games 7-1. If they're in a 2-1 game, you know what that tells me is that the, the, high, the defense did its job that day and the best offense in the NHL in the last 20 years failed. And if that happens, that happens. Congrats. You beat the Panthers that night. But like if the Panthers are scoring two goals in a game, regardless of whether it's playoffs and playoff rules and playoff grittiness and all that shit, like that was a bad night for the Panthers offense. They're in the two, one goal range. Like, I mean, any team that's going to be able to successfully keep them down that much is going to have to shoot themselves in the foot offensively to some extent, right? So we, we yeah. don't expect the team that just, like, is playing 2-1 games right now. They're going to be able to continue scoring their three, four goals or whatever, but they'll hold the Panthers to two or one. I just – I don't see it that way. Like, if it's a 0-0 game, it's a 0-0 game. Like, that, that was a very stupid way to put it. But I think that you guys get what I mean. Like, if, if it's in – the mud, the other teams in the mud too, you know, they're, they're going to be trapped with us, you know, rather than us being trapped with them. I mean, you can yeah. always hit a hot, you can always hit a hot goaltender in the playoffs. Uh, I mean, you look at what Fazilevsky has done and you look at some of the things that these goaltenders are dragging their teams, kicking and screaming through playoffs before. But I think that it would be, I would be surprised to see this team get held to, a two, one game. It would be, it would be a surprising game. It would be a surprising situation. I think that I know that there's, there's not much of it, but I think there's enough playoff experience on this team now so that they're, that they are ready for these moments now. And they're not going to be totally in over their heads and panic. I think they've got enough of it three years, (laughs) three seasons in a row for some of these guys, a couple of these guys, but yeah, I, I think that it would be surprising to see this offense get held to, one or two goals it has not happened very often this season in terms of key contributors the only players without more than a series of playoff experience are lundell spencer knight and sam reinhardt that's it everyone else i guess mason marchman but like everyone else either played last year or the year before or with other teams like spencer drew's got a ton of uh, spencer drew claude drew's got a ton of playoff experience Barkov's been in this, this will be his fourth or fifth playoff series, depending on what you consider that, uh, or I guess it's his fourth. If you consider that play in round in the bubble, a playoff series, like he's got 2015 last year, the bubble round and this year's that's four DJ. No, no, I'm saying it's uh, three to me. I was trying to say it's three to me. Yeah. It's three. I, I, but you know what? It was a do or die situation. I agree. That wasn't the playoffs, but like, yeah, I, I, in I'll terms of the as, mentality, I'll count it as experience. I, I do agree with that in terms of the mentality where it's you have to win or you go home and your season's over 
Like they've got, yes, they have first round experience. It's not, you know, long cup run experience, but whatever. The reality is that it, it gets to a point where that's kind of overrated. Like you either have the talent and have the, the, the drive to make a run or you don't. And, you know, we'll see that out of this team this year when they, whether they have the drive. Um, I know we kind of already shifted away from it, but I want to say like Ian, you said it like goalies can steal a series. We saw it. I mean, freaking. Uh, Thomas Grice stole a series from the Panthers back in 2012. Igor Shesterkin's a guy that everyone's terrified is going to steal a series, but it's like, good luck. You, you may get the pain. There's, you know, held to one or to two in one game. You may do it in two games. You're not doing it four out of seven. They're going to get their goals. So like, like Jacob has been saying, you want to see if we, I dare you to try and outscore us. We now have, you know, arguably the most talented first line in the NHL after Boston, like, and then we have a ton of depth behind it. Like, good luck. Come at me, bro. And I know we've kicked the rounds and we're going to try to have a podcast where we talk about what is actually playoff style hockey. You know, does the Panthers style of play like get shut down in the playoffs? That's something we're going to look at because skeptics, and I mean, when I say skeptics, I really mean haters, but we're going to give them the benefit of the doubt by saying skeptics for now. Uh, They say, oh, well, the Panthers can't win in the playoffs because there's less space and there's more penalties, you know, that aren't called, yada, yada, yada. Well, let's actually take a skeptical eye to that. Uh, That's something we're we're going to try to do uh, a little bit later on as the regular season winds down. I mean, to just give a kind of sneak preview on that more in-depth look, that's not – everyone makes the assumption that the Panthers play run-and-gun hockey, and it's not. It's an aggressive all-out attack style, but it's not run-and-gun where they're just trading chances, playing high-variance hockey against their opponent. No, they attack the puck on defense. They attack the puck in the neutral zone, and they quickly transition. It's actually very similar to what the Lightning do, except right now the Panthers have a better forward group. So it's not running gun hockey. It's all out attack. It's extremely aggressive. It's high energy, but it's not running gun. There's a very, so I wouldn't even call it a subtle difference. There's a very distinct difference. And that's why I personally think it's going to translate. Well, it's not like their offense is run off of stretch passes that it's not like their offense is run off of stretch passes and you need all this space. I mean, honestly, their, their offense runs better when they're making quick passes and they have better possession and it's not just trying to stretch the ice. I mean, that's what happened. That's literally what happened in the New Jersey game. They were playing completely outside of their style. And then in the third period, it suddenly is like, okay, there's the Panthers we've seen all season. And you saw the possession that they did on obviously a, a much lesser team, but nonetheless, I don't think that this team will have an issue in the playoffs with less space. I think that's the kind of, that's actually the kind of thing they thrive in. The one thing that I have seen the issue, uh, lately is when the slot gets clogged up a little bit but they seem to have figured that out in the last two games so yeah and Ian I don't I don't know how much you have a chance to listen to this because I know you're very busy and I'm going to sound like a broken record here but Jack Han on the PDO podcast is basically saying exactly what you did I don't know if you've listened to that yet you need to go back and do it because he just he talks about exactly what you just said the Panthers don't play a stretch pass game it's get the puck to the boards and then a quick a quick pass to a streaking player coming up the wing and it's funnel the puck through the center of the ice after a chip to the boards. So their breakout is safe, but then as soon as they get to the neutral zone, it's extremely aggressive as they're trying to get to the puck, get the puck on Barkov stick or Huberto's stick, your best players that can take the puck up ice and gain possession in the offensive zone. Which is also why they tend to give up quite a few odd man rushes on occasion because they're getting once they get out of their zone it's just all push it's push 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 and that's when you do end up with a especially when it's a one of the defensemen bringing it up through the neutral zone that's when you do end up in some of that trouble sometimes but the good news is it happens infrequently enough and they put up enough goals to it's okay to give up those every once in a while yeah i mean the proof is in the pudding they have the best goal differential in the nhl by a decent margin, by a lot, yeah, ten percent more than the Avalanche, and they're like doubling up the Lightning, you know, just just to put it into perspective. Yeah, Panthers and, are at plus eighty three, Colorado's at plus seventy three. Just to add that stat in there for you, TJ, continue please. A little bit more than ten percent, and even when they're in the offensive zone, we seem them utilize a, a few like inventive things, like. J- 
Jack Han is a really big fan of the two, three offensive style, which is when you have three guys towards the point, the opposing teams, whenever they're really trying to be conservative defensively, like Ian said, will try to clog up the slot. How do you get around that? Well, you get some downward movement. So there's less time for an opposing player to react to you getting into a scoring position. Perfect example of this was Anthony Duclair's first goal against Buffalo. He's at the point. And it's a little bit of an imperfect, an imperfect example because it happened after a turnover. But there's three players at the point, and Duclair is able to leverage that position where nobody is covering him because they're still kind of covering the net uh, to make sure that the breakout was successful. And once it was unsuccessful, they're still in that area. They're still close to the net. Duclair is far away from the net, but that means he can skate into a wrist shot downhill and have all the time in the world to pick a corner. And by the time he finishes his stride, he's in the high slot. So this is a way that you can utilize offensive zone position and uh, the defensive tactics of another team against them is if you utilize that space, you have high in the offensive zone, you come down towards the net, you have momentum, less time for the defense to close you down. We saw Duclair score using that. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that what the Panthers do, like, not many teams can play. Like, the Devils can't adopt what the Panthers do exactly like that because you need to have a lot of things. You need to have skill. You need to have speed. You need to have shooting talent. You know, if if it's Radko Gudas, right? If it's Radko Gudas walking into that shot, or let's do, well, let's say let's say if it's Nola Chari walking into that shot rather than you know uh, Anthony Duclair, Duclair, Anthony Duclair, it's not you know the odds of it getting going in are are much less. And when you're the Florida Panthers and you're trotting out a third line of Mason Marchman, Anton Lundell, Sam Reinhardt, and you're going up against another team's third line that is nowhere near that skill, you're still going to get these offense, offensive chances that have a good shot of going in. I mean, Ryan Lomberg is giving you third line production and he's your fourth liner right now. He's got nine goals this year. And he's missed a bunch of time. Yeah, he was healthy scratch for like the first eighth of the season i want to say you know like 10 to 15 games he was getting healthy scratched he's played 48 games this season they played 69 yeah in 48 games he's got he's 9 and 18 18 17 Uh, he's He's on like a 35 ish point pace what do you think his shooting percentage is it's got to be absurd it's got to be like 21 or something no something unsustainable it's up it's up at 10 and a half percent but it's still that's not bad still higher than i expected it to be it's pretty yeah but that, but that's not unsustainable. Ten and a half, like that's a good season for a grinder. But that's it's a, not. It's like, a very good season for a grinder. Right, but it, but it's not. You know, when like Anthony Duclair at the beginning of the year, when he was scoring all those goals, was up at like twenty five percent for the first month and a half of the season. It's like you knew that would eventually fall back to earth, and I'm sure it has. But like ten and a half percent, that's pretty reasonable. Mason Marshman has finally fallen back to a slightly more terrestrial 14 and a half. So that, that feels a little bit more correct for that line. Uh, what was he shooting? Wasn't he shooting at some, something absurd? Yeah, like he was closer to like 18, 19. That's unbelievable. I mean, yeah. he's at, he's at 14 and a half feels right. It still feels good for him, but nonetheless. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Interruption. No, that's, that's, we, we, we there's no structure on the Panther Parade podcast. Just fucking wing it. <laughs> Especially rip today, you know, we're, we're just really waiting to see like, what's the standings going to be at the end of the year, who are they going to play? And then of course, like the playoffs, we all know that that's what really matters at this point. It's a little bit of like, you know, over, over analyzing small differences from this point until the playoffs actually start. I've always said it, like we could talk about standings. We could talk about, you know, opponents, all we want, I would trade all of it to win game one. Oh, absolutely. It's, you know, and there's all this nonsense. Like, for example, tomorrow, there's another game against the Leafs. It's going to be overanalyzed to death. It's going to be the third game in Fortnite for both teams with the Panthers having the edge of they had tonight off while the Leafs were playing and the Panthers are going to be at home. And I mean, that's still pretty close to a sludge game considering, again, third game in four nights for both teams. And there's going to be whichever way it goes, there's going to be so many overreactions to it. And it's like, yeah, I'd love to see the Panthers win that game eight one and shut up some of the haters who have been like, Oh, well, the least got them the first time and statement blah, blah, blah. game statement. Yeah. It was yeah. a statement. game. That was weird. Just it was weird. a state. 
it was a statement game. And it's like, yeah, I'd love to see the Panthers, you know, put up a statement, but just going back to last year, remember how many statements the Panthers made in those last two games against Tampa Bay. And then the playoffs happened in Tampa won game one and they won game two. I'll give up all the statements. The last 13 games of the year, every single statement can go against the Panthers. Give me game one of the playoffs. I do still feel like there's a significant edge going against Washington rather than one of the other six teams that are going to make the playoffs in the East. Oh, absolutely. That all being said, like I, it, it, it does still feel like it's, you know, overanalyzing game one is still more important than all of that. It's still a Washington, like another weak performance. I can't remember if it was Saturday or Sunday where the wild beat them like four, nothing. They really don't look very good right now. They lost five to one to the wild on Sunday. Okay. I think that was the second game uh, of a back-to-back for Minnesota. I think that they beat Carolina the previous night. So thanks to the Minnesota for that, by the way, because now the Panthers are four points ahead in the Eastern conference, even on games played with Carolina. When it looks like the Leafs will win this game tonight against the lightning, they will be five points ahead of in the division with a game in hand. So that's where the standings are right now. If the Leafs didn't beat the Lightning, uh, they have a two-goal lead right now in the third period. Then uh, I'll uh, old takes expose myself. But that's that's where it stands in terms of the standings, and it's a pretty enviable position to be. And really, only Carol or not Caroline, really only Colorado is in a, a spot where they feel more secure in being the top spot in their own conference. Yeah, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious. You want you want the, the Caps in the first round. Like, there's a pretty substantial drop from that middle group of teams in the East of, you know, Boston, Pittsburgh, Rangers, and then Washington. Like, you want Washington in the first round. I feel like yeah, this rather- is actually, like, a good, you know, talk radio style, like, you know, conversation at the bar topic. Who of the other six teams do you think is the biggest threat? let's say we all agree that Washington is the least amount of threat. And I don't know if you were about to say something about that, Ian, but you can, you can comment on that as, as well. Uh, well, but, I, I wasn't, I was going to specifically say, I don't necessarily want to see a Rangers team in the first round with just the way he is. I'd rather the Panthers. I mean, obviously that's, that wasn't exactly what you were asking me before, but if, if we're looking in the, you know, later into the East, I wouldn't mind seeing them in the Eastern Conference Finals because, and obviously that's where they would see them. But I want to see Shuster. I feel worse for Carolina or whoever has to face them in the beginning because facing Shusterkin now is going to be tough. Facing versus facing Shusterkin. Maybe I should start this whole part over. <laughs> no, you're good. You're it's good. Fine. It's fine. We want to Shuster- make you look bad. The- you want to make me look like I appreciate that. So what I was trying to say was. I was going to say, I was going to answer the question of who looks good in this conference as well. I would not want to face the Rangers, no matter who what team I was going for, because I don't want to face just early in the playoffs. I'd rather see him after a grueling round or two, for, you know, we're thinking Panthers, but uh, as for who the Panthers could play, who would I want to see or who would I not want to see? I, I was well. thinking not once. Yeah. Not I mean, once. It, 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 it's gotta be, I mean, you can tell us who you want, but it's gotta be the Capitals, right? Oh, who would I not want? No, who you do want? Yeah, oh, yeah, we, be absolutely. We answered that question opposite because yeah, I, who I do you not want to see? I was originally saying like we all agree the Capitals is who they want to see. After Correct. that, like, who are you most afraid of? Well, I mean, look, Tampa's not going to be fun for us to play against just simply because they've had our number in the playoffs and they've had our number one well, not this season, but they had our season our our. They've had our number in season past, and they also have Vasilevsky, who can literally drag them through a first round playoff series. Yeah, I, I, the Tampa is easily my number one of team I do not want to see in the first round. Look, if that's who the opponent is, that's who the opponent is. I'm not scared, but like, I'm not scared of anyone in the playoffs against this Florida Panthers team. They're just that good. Like, yes, could any anyone knock them out? It's hockey. Like Ian was saying, the reason we don't want to see Shesterkin is if there's a goalie who can steal a playoff series, it's Igor Shesterkin. You know, he's looked human the past couple of weeks or so. I don't want to see him in the first round because it's like really, you know, the, the most likely oper- you know, chance to, to get Columbus v. Tampa is against Igor Shesterkin. So it's like, let's just not, you know, let's not do that. You know, give, me, give me the Capitals who look like, you know, they just want Ovi to get his regular season goal record. Whatever happens in the playoffs happens. Yeah, give me that. Uh, after that, definitely don't want to see Tampa. Like you said, Vasilevsky. Despite you know the fact that they look a little bit more human than last year, 
that's still a defending champ, champs who have all of their best players still on the roster. Yeah, give me them in round two or round three, please. Two time defending champs. Well, yeah, two time defending champs. Like, give, give me some. Give me someone that we should like. The Panthers should be able to put away in five, in four or five. Like, give me give me Washington. And I know. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah, I I, I totally I'm agree. Like, hugely old take saying the Panthers can take Washington four or five. Yeah, I mean that can always happen. Like like you said, it is hockey. Uh, I want to oh, ask well, you guys we something. We lost though. TJ again. So I'm curious if you guys were aware of this, and I'll have you guess. Who's the number one five-on-five five expected goals team in the league? Is it just goals or goal differential? Five-on-five five expected goals percentage. I would have okay, said, percentage. Okay. I would have said maybe Calgary. I think it's Boston now because I've been tracking this. It is Boston. <laughs> it is Boston. Some yes. things to consider with Boston that lead me to believe they're the team that I want to see the least, not even like just a team I want to see the least in the first round. P- potentially, they're the biggest threat. We're talking about playoff hockey. They're going to shorten the bench. All of a sudden, you got the perfection line coming at you even more than you would in a regular season game. Best expected goals team in the league. That defense is stacked. I mean, I think people don't really appreciate how good guys like Mike Riley, Matt Grizzlick, Brandon Carlo defensively. You know, Brandon Carlo has got kind of one dimension to his game, but it is a good dimension. And that's going to be very useful in the playoffs. It, it, it seems like it's kind of a, a matchup, maybe not a bad matchup, but a matchup I don't really prefer. Like that's a team that if anybody's going to be able to lock down the high octane Panthers offense, it would be them. I'm not saying that I think that it would happen if they were to play, but like that's the most plausible scenario to the Panthers getting frustrated by somebody in the Eastern conference to me. The, the wild card is like Tampa potentially turning it off and turning it on back on in the playoffs like a lot of people will make the argument oh you know Tampa has learned that the regular season doesn't mean anything and once we see them in the playoffs it's going to be a totally different team but I would contend that we're just looking at a totally different team than that two-time Stanley Cup champions of course the whole third line's gone and they've replaced them with guys like Pierre Edward Belmar Nick Paul Corey Perry like I don't think nearly as highly of of those players as I do of Yanni Gord, Blake Coleman, Barkley Goodrow. And if you want to say they're all, they're all grinders. I I really didn't think that they were just grinders like Blake Coleman in particular. I think he's got plenty of skill and just kind of suffers from some bad shooting percentage luck at times. And not, not even just the third line getting worse, like some of their role players that they've relied upon for key contributions in the playoffs, guys like Andre Pilat, Alex Kalorn, Ryan McDonough, they're going from early 30s to mid 30s right before our eyes, which is right when you see that age related decline get a little bit steeper. Now, that's not to say that I think they're all of a sudden we're going to be seeing Milan Lucic, you know, they're going to be non factors because I, I don't think that's the case, but I think it's something to be looking out for, you know, especially since. They just won two cups, so the motivation might not be as high as it once was. And the winning the two cups means in the last two postseasons, which have all involved condensed schedules, they've played all those games that they needed to play to win both those cups. They have the least fresh legs of any team. Those are all good points, but Andre Vasilevsky still exists. Yeah, Andre so Vasilevsky Steven, is a great counterpoint. So does Steven I, Stamkos. So does Braden Point. So does Nikita Kucherov. I'm not. I'm not scared of Stamkos, but the other two, I'll give you. Right, but it, it's it's just that team. You know, you know, we talk about shortening the bench, and yes, their depth isn't what it was, but that team runs a top six that can compete with anybody, and that includes the Panthers. I think the Panthers have the edge, but you know. Kucherov and point on a, on a heater with Vasilevsky on a heater. And that's that, that they take down, they take down another, a third cup with those three guys getting hot. Like that's what it, that's how good that those oh, guys it's are. Total, it's totally plausible. But I, I really think that like your case for Tampa Bay being like one of the two or three best teams in the conference has to start with Vasilevsky. Yes. But because like, give me the perfection line over their first line. Give me Barkov and whatever's on his wings over their first line. Even though, like, you know, I think very highly of Point and Kucherov. Even even the top end talent, like Boston again has Charlie McAvoy. He's on the level of Victor Hedman. We have Aaron Ekblad. 
you know, now we the Panthers. You, you can say we, we're, it's fine. Look, we've been bleeding with this team for 20 <laughs> plus years each. Like, I, I hate people. It's like, oh, you can't say we, you're not on the roster. And it's like, yeah, well, some of these guys on the roster got here two weeks ago. I've had my heart ripped out by this organization a ton of times. Like, I'm saying we, get over yourself. Question, can we still refer to them as the perfection line if Pasta's not on the line anymore? That's a good point. That's a good point. And you actually criticized me on that t- uh, last podcast, TJ, where I called it the perfection line. You're like, the perfection line doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> so, way to go. This pasta's not on it. But honestly, I do wanna... like they put Craig Smith on it, and it's it's still like pretty much at the same level. Like, still one of the best lines in the league. Like sixty percent plus course the expected goals, sh- just like obscene shit. It hasn't really dropped off that much. And like Hall Pasternak is now a really dynamic second line. That's one of the things that has really led them to go from kind of like guaranteed to be first wild card to now all of a sudden they could finish second in the division. We wouldn't be that surprised. Is that pasta hall line? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. The hall took an elbow today. (laughs) It's a pasta. Yeah. The hall Uh, took a a stick to the face today. So who knows how he's going to be doing. Uh, I do want to just point out that when you asked us to guess who had the highest expected goals for percentage, uh, I did at least get the, I guessed Calgary and I did at least guess the third team, which is, yeah. they're only behind Boston and, and, uh, and Florida. Uh, Those are like your top three teams in all the possession stats. So I think that it, it's not unfair to say, especially considering you're talking about Swayman, who's been like 930 for the past two months, Bobrovsky, who's got two Vezinas and, um, why can't I remember his name? He was a freaking Panther. Jacob Markstrom is, is a very oh, capable Calgary. goalie. Was he a Vezina finalist two years ago? He might have been just because Vancouver always gets extra media uh, pub they don't deserve. But, I mean, I would call Mar- Markstrom more than capable. He's uh, a top, I would say, top 10 goalie in the NHL, maybe top 12. But he's really good. And, like, he looked when he was with – when he left the Panthers in the Luongo trade, I was like, oh, yeah. I mean, good luck on that one, but he's pretty weak, but he turned it around. I think that, you know, Vasilevsky obviously had a couple of really good games in that series, but in terms of the goaltending last year in the first round, the Panthers really just needed to get, like, decent goaltending. It's not even like they didn't have somebody at Vasilevsky's level, so it was over. You know, everybody just kind of shit a brick there, except for Spencer. You know, you, you can't really blame game six on him. But uh, games games one and two, and even three when they won, they needed a save. The, actually, the, the question that came up then when Spencer came in and had, you know, played as well as he did was, you know, the what ifs of what if he had played one, two, or three. Uh, and that's sort of the only reason I even bring that up is if the Panthers do face the Lightning, if they just get, they don't even need, like, I think, Spencer was stellar in the play. I don't even think they need that. They just need somewhere between that and what we, uh, what we're seeing now is fine. Somewhere between that and here would be chef's kiss. Yeah. Just keep your goal saved above expected, slightly positive. Don't give away bad goals and you're going to be fine. The other thing Cross checks for 60. Just call some of the cross checks you didn't call in the last series, and the Panthers are going to be in good shape. We are running out of time, so Ian, riff on whatever you want to riff on, plug whatever you want to plug so we can get out of here. One last uh, Panthers riff, actually, and it is I have never seen anyone get Olayed in my life like Uyghur did. In the Montreal game, I've never seen the, that. Buffalo, the Buffalo game again. Uh, I've never Buffalo seen season. that. I have never seen anyone. I mean, that's you know, like comic book, like comics when they you used to have the the, <laughs> the matador. The bull, the, thank you, the matador and the bull charger, and like he would just whip. It. I mean, that's what that was, and it was hilarious. Mostly because that was the only that was pr- probably his best game in a while, and that was the you know the moment that's going to stick out it's definitely going to be a dang it i don't know if you guys watch steve dangle stuff on on that's definitely going to be a dang it but he had a great game otherwise uh and i had been a little bit concerned about his play recently but that was a that if we get that out of him that'd be great but that's kind of that was the one thing i needed to bring up because i've never in my life i mean his his helmet almost came off he had we gave himself whiplash so badly 
it, it honestly looked like one of those kids run, like skating for the first time when they run into the boards that just crumple. And like, it was, it was incredible. Like I've never seen someone fall like that. And it, it, it's really funny because, you know, by all the advanced metrics, Mackenzie Weaver was the best player on the ice lot last night and Rasmus Dahlin was the worst. But if you only saw that clip, you were thinking to yourself, man, yeah, look, Dahlin's finally coming into his own. He just embarrassed Mackenzie Weaver. But that's how it is. Ian, I do got to ask you one question. How's reporting on spring break? It was, uh, it was peachy. It was peachy? It was peachy. I got to ask, ask you some questions about that. <laughs> you know, I... Uh, I, I got to uh, butt in here. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, my, was it a full buddy, moon that night? It was. <laughs> my buddy, it were actually, it was Tatooine. There were two full moons. You, you might not have noticed top corner. I did see that. Yeah. So my buddy, Victor Okendo, who works for ABC, texted me a couple of days ago, and he just sent me a picture he had been reporting on the wars. There's over, it was in Poland. And then he was coming back through London. And as he was on his way to the bathroom, the guy sitting in front of him on the airplane had the video up on the plane. And he was so stunned by what he was seeing that he just like awkwardly took a picture of this man. He was like, you've, you're, you were in, not only were you like in London, but you were on a, <laughs> you were on a plane. Just with some rent. He goes, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Yeah, Ian Margo just... was a Mr. Worldwide. Pitbull, eat your heart out. There it is. All well, right. You know, hopefully you were able to shake that off. You know, it could have been, it could have been way worse. I just was trying to get in one more joke. I know Ian's got to go. Okay. Yeah, we got to get out of here. Ian, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you everyone for listening. Uh, rate us five stars on WikiFeet. Uh, you know, you know, you <laughs> no, want to. No, please don't go on there. <laughs> <laughs> What really? No. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee you there's no photos of my feet on Wiki Feet, but go no, rate us there will, there will never be. Yeah, I'll you never know, be you, famous enough. TJ, I, you I'm know sad he thought that of I know that. that is. TJ, you know he thought of that hours ago and has been waiting. For <laughs> Actually, no, it's it's stolen from one of our listeners. Thanks, Josh. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you guys for all listening. Uh, hope you guys enjoy the episode. We're gonna try and come back with another one this week as we ramp up our coverage leading up to the playoffs. I don't know if we're going to get back into daily podcasts like we did last playoffs. That's up to TJ, but thank you. Thank you, Ian, for joining us for uh, TJ Peterson. I'm Alex Lopez. Thank you guys for listening. We'll see you next time.